Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Dave Bisak. I'm Chief API Officer at Aperture. I'm going to talk about the art of API design. So I'm really thrilled to be kicking off our API design track this morning. Thank you all for attending. Um, one disclaimer I want to give here is none of the content you're about to see was generated by an AI. That's all authentic. Um, just a little bit of background about myself. Um, I've been in the software industry for 38 plus years. Um, most of that time I've been doing API design in some sort or another. It used to be just libraries and frameworks. Now it's been RESTful APIs for about the last dozen or so years. Um, prior to joining SAS when it was founded in 2017, I worked at SAS. I've got a couple of colleagues from SAS here as well. Um, and I've got a couple of colleagues from Aperture here as well too. So we're, we're really well represented. Um, so I joined Aperture in 2017 and right now I'm Chief API Officer, which basically means I'm responsible for our API program. Aperture is an API first driven company that delivers banking as a service basically. So we provide online software as a service for banking for several hundred community banks and credit unions across the United States. And as we're adding new features to improve the experience for our customers, we start with APIs and build those APIs and then we build the front ends around those APIs and we deliver those to our customers. We have a developer portal and all that kind of other stuff that goes along with it. Um, at the bottom of the screen is some contact information. If you'd like to contact me afterwards, feel free to connect on, on LinkedIn or, or whatever. Um, I quit Twitter a long time ago, so I'm not on Twitter anymore, but I am on Mastodon on Fossodon.org. Um, so feel free to contact me. So I want to start by just talking a little bit about what I think API design is. Everybody, I'm sure, has their own definition of what, what this is. Um, but to me, basically, API design is a translation process. It's taking requirements from your product team. So you're building a new product, you're adding a new feature, you have to take those requirements, understand them, and then map them into a, an API that delivers those capabilities so people can build applications on top of those APIs. Um, so that translation exercise is really the most critical part of API design, understanding the domain and then mapping it into an API. Um, but as you go along, you also have to be able to create this durable abstraction, and an API is an abstraction layer um, that encapsulates what's being done on the back end. It has to be fit to the problem at hand. It has to actually solve a real problem and do that one job and do it really well, but also anticipate other solutions, other products that might get built um, later on or new applications that may use your API in ways that you may not have anticipated. But in order to give a good developer experience, that API has to be comprehensible. Someone has to be able to look at it. They need to be able to discover it first, like look it up in your catalog or whatever, and using keywords that they're familiar with, find the API that's going to solve their particular need. And then the API has to be comprehensible. They have to be able to look at it, understand it, know how to use it, know how to put it into their application. And if you fail with that, then you don't really have a good, good API that's very usable. So you, you have to think about that. Um, and also, this API, an API is something that's going to isolate your client from changes that occur on the back end. As, as someone who's building that back end, you want to be able to change, re-architect, refactor, et cetera, without breaking your client. So the API is part of that encapsulation layer that hides those implementation details that should not impact the consumer. So, so that the, the front end applications or the consumers of those APIs don't have to change when the back end changes. So that's the role of doing API design is, is accounting for all of these factors. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about, the title of this talk is The Art of API Design. And to me, API design is an actually, it's, a, it's an art. So we're going to talk about it a little bit as an art. As an art. The first thing is to, to realize that every time you design or create a new a API, it's really a commissioned work. You're creating an API for a purpose. There is someone who has a need that needs to be exposed, a uh, service or capability needs to be exposed via an API. So it's a commissioned work just like regular artwork is. And it requires some degree of creativity in how you go about solving that particular problem. And we're gonna talk next about creativity. There's a lot of aspects about that that we have to be concerned about. To me, API designs also, like art, can and probably should have aesthetics. I like it when APIs have beauty or elegance or balance and harmony. Those are artistic or aesthetic characteristics of APIs that I like to see because I think they improve developer experience 
and they make an API a joy to work with. But really what I'm saying here is that API design is really sort of a right brain activity. I mentioned creativity, and I want to talk about this a little bit because there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can interpret creativity and how it impacts API design. The first thing is perhaps creativity or novelty is not really welcome in API design because there are a lot of negative things that can come from being creative. And as Bill Dorfield mentioned um, in his talk this morning, like you look at things like creativity. The Beatles, every time they created, well, not every time, but, but they were known for creating new musical styles and changing the industry with each new album that came out. Um, that has a negative effect when we talk about APIs. If there's too much creativity, it's going to impact the, the usability and the adoption of the APIs, particularly around consistency. Um, so Weezer was a really good example of consistency. And so if you had consumed one Weezer album, it's pretty easy for you to consume the next. And the same thing should be true with APIs and consistency. If you're too creative with your APIs, then it's, it's likely people won't be able to consume those APIs as well. So for example, an API that uses Greek letters or musical notes for their REST API paths is very creative, but it's not very usable, right? So we have to be aware of overusing creativity when we're creating APIs. And related to that notion of consistency is also reuse. So too much creativity is going to ignore or it's gonna conflict with reuse um, whether it's reuse of conceptual ideas that the, that the user has, um, being able to reuse libraries, if you're reusing standards, like if you're implementing a REST API on top of HTTP, you know, you can't, you have to be able to reuse things like the existing HTTP uh, verbs, et cetera. And therefore, too much creativity is going to increase the learning curve and the adoption rate of your APIs. And that's not good for anybody. Um, so it's nice to be creative, but you have to be careful and use it cautiously and use creativity where it's, where it's necessary. So really what I'm trying to get at is APIs really must be more utilitarian. Um, and, and, and both Bill and, and Paul talked about style um, you know, and having a unique style or a unique voice. And there's something to be said for that. You want to be able to stand out from the crowd, but also APIs really need to value function over style or substance over style. Um, so it's important to be more utilitarian in API design. Um, we've all heard that phrase that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but a beautiful, elegant API that's very stylistic, but which no one can use, is not really a good API. It's what I would call an abominable pretender imposter instead. So let's look at the flip side of that. We talked about API design as an art, but there's also a scientific or a science aspect of API design that we can talk about. For example, we can actually study API designs. And Bill gave a lot of good information about some of the work that's going on. All these companies produce kind of the state of the API. Um, and they're able to do that because people are writing their APIs in things like Open API or other formats that we can actually ingest and do data analysis on and things like that. So we can consume those APIs and we can study them. We can, we can look for vulnerabilities um, and we can look for usability and we can look at API traffic and all that kind of stuff. So it's a field of study. Um, we can look at API design and looking at what's being done, we can infer or discover patterns in those APIs. And that helps us design the next API that comes after that by looking for patterns and being able to reuse those patterns. And that improves consistency and adoption of APIs as well if you have identifiable patterns and you can document them for your users. Um, but also we can learn from others and we can evolve our practice. And really what we can do is improve the state of the art of API design. Um, and in that regard, I think API design is sort of also a left brain activity as well because we can apply rigor and, and methods and stuff. So we've kind of talked about left brain, right brain, art versus science, um, but really I want to talk next about kind of API design as an act of intelligence. Um, Paul Dumas, how many people attended Paul's keynote this morning? Okay, um, he did a re really good job of kind of setting us up for understanding the impact of AI, in particular generative AI, in creating APIs and doing API design with the generative API. AI. So let's talk a little bit about that and really what it means. How many people here have a role of doing API design? 
as part of their job. So a, a good number of you, that, that's good. So you may be looking at, at Paul's talk and, and wondering, Says, what's going to happen to me? You know, <laughs> is my job at risk? Am I going to be doing API design five years from now? If you want to do, are you going to be able to do that um, if you haven't decided to move on? So let's talk a little bit about the impact of, of AI. Um, but first, let's, let's, I really want to ca classify API design as an act of intelligence. So when we're doing API design, we're really weighing and looking at lots of different competing forces that offset each other that we have to consider when we're putting together a new API design. We have to, as I mentioned earlier, doing that requirements analysis, understanding the domain model, working with the product team so that the API fits the need. Um, we have to really be able to solve the problems at hand, but we also have to consider security and attack vectors. I work in the banking industry, right? So I'm very concerned about regulatory compliance around APIs. Um, we're, we're doing APIs that deal with people's money and their bank accounts and things like that. So compliance is, is top of mind for us as well. But there's other aspects, legal, PII. Um, Bill mentioned all these different security leaks that have occurred recently in, a, in APIs. So we have to be aware of that and know how to design safeguards into the APIs to keep them secure. The API surface area, and, and we also heard a little bit about API sprawl and the growth of APIs and the explosion of APIs. As the API surface area gets bigger, it just means that they're harder to manage, harder to understand, but they're also more susceptible to AI, uh, API attack vectors, et cetera. Um, developer experience, as I mentioned, is a key thing for us to keep in mind, and that really comes down to ease of use. And there's lots of different metrics for ease of use, but things that I view as important for API design and ease of use are going to be clarity, conceptual integrity. When you look at an API, is it clear what it does or does it mingle too many things together, too many unrelated aspects or different domains that, that can limit its, its conceptual integrity? Can it be understood? Does it have the right mental model that the developer can ingest and understand? Can they get the whole thing in their head or is it too big to understand? So what's the cognitive load for understanding and using that API? Is the API complete? And symmetry is another, another part of that. Um, can it be implemented? It's, it's very easy to create APIs that cannot be implemented on the back end, or they can be implemented, but the performance is going to be abysmal. So we have to consider that as well. So you have to understand a little bit about how you go about implementing APIs. Consistency and symmetry and completeness are things. So if in an API, if I can create a resource, I probably will need a way to delete the resource. If I can list a collection and I can get individual objects, I probably also need ways to update those objects in the API. So that's where symmetry and meeting developer expectations comes into play. And then you have to consider API evolution. How is the API going to evolve over time and how can you design the API now such that it can be evolved, it can change? And I'm not talking about specific versioning. Um, I, I think I, I prefer to really think more about API evolution. How can you add features to the API in a way that doesn't break your existing clients? How does it evolve and grow over time in a reasonable way? And there are a lot of patterns for, for doing things like that. And then finally, there's this, this notion of enablement that is participating in this larger ecosystem. So by using existing specifications like Open API, Async API, JSON schema, et cetera. You can build SDKs, you can do automated testing, um, you can do security analysis, you can do shift left type stuff, you can do um, static security scanning, all kinds of other tools in the API ecosystem that can build upon that um, through this enablement. And, and being aware of those tools is part of how you design APIs such that they can participate in that larger ecosystem. So when we continue to talk about this, this notion of being um, kind of an act of intelligence, I, I also think that API design is really just the art of making decisions. Um, looking at all those factors that one has to consider, you have to make, have a decision procedure to, when you have a technical challenge ahead of you and you've got multiple options, how do you choose the right option um, at a given point in time? And that decision process is, is really at the core of doing API design. And one of the things that we do at Aperture, and one of the first things that I did was to create 
um, a set of API design guidelines that put together a decision procedure for us. So for example, security is always going to be one of the foremost things that we will consider. So when we have a design choice that, that's in front of us, and we can have a trade-off. We can either keep it more secure, or we can make it easier to use. And we're always going to err on the side of keeping it more secure. It may make the API a little bit harder to use in order for it to be secure, but we're gonna opt for that. That's part of our decision procedure. And, and that's one of the things that, that you can keep in mind as you're doing API design. Um, so you can have those rubrics and decision procedures, but then also you can record and measure outcomes based on that as well. So you can think about uh, your, your activity. So knowing when to apply patterns is also a decision point, and there's lots of patterns that, that can come into play. Cruddle um, design patterns, hypermedia design patterns, which API style you're going to use, whether it's a RESTful API or an async API or gRPC or, or GraphQL, et cetera. And naming things is also a really great decision point. And that was, that was mentioned earlier, too, about uh, naming things is one of the hardest things in computer science. And the same is true, of course, for, for API design as well. Um, Matthew Reinbold has a really good blog post about naming things in APIs. So really what I'm saying though is to me, API design is a whole brain activity. It is an act of intelligence that requires both the left brain and the right brain in order to succeed. So let's jump into AI a little bit. Now I know that there's a whole other track on AI and, and Paul DeMoss talked about generative AI uh, this morning. I'm just going to kind of extend a little bit of what, what um, Paul mentioned. So I've been, as I said, I've been a professional for about 38 years. I've been following AI that entire time. I'm not an active AI researcher or, or engineer working in the AI field. I'm, I'm more of a person who is consuming and monitoring it and evaluating AI. Um, but I have been aware of it for, for a long, long time. And really, in that 38 years, 38 plus years, the one thing that I've learned is to never set a bar that AI is not going to be able to surpass. We've done that many, many times in the past, and AI has always come along and done a better job than we had expected, sometimes faster than we think. Driving cars might be that thing. We'll, we'll see if that actually pans out or not. Um, but I also want to have a reality check, right? Um, many companies succeed with crappy APIs. So if you're using a generative AI to create your API, and you might think it's pretty crappy, Keep in mind that there are a lot of AI, APIs built by people that are also crappy. Um, so we can still work with a APIs that aren't as, really, as ideal as we would really like. So all these generative AIs, they, they work on tons of training data. But the thing to keep in mind as you're looking at adopting these tools is what will you use to train the generative AI that you're going to use? Are the decisions that those APIs that fed that model, did they make the same decisions that you would have made? How do you know? And, and this gets to that black box problem. We don't really know how those AIs um, got the data that they're using and how those APIs that fed those, those models were created, what decisions were made, and what choices were, ma were they made, um, and you know, what styles were in play, et cetera. So there's lots of things to keep in mind. Um, there's a really good podcast from aboard.com. Um, I think the main risk here is that everybody thinks everybody else's job is easy. And as an API designer, your job is going to be to, to talk to your executives to make sure they don't think that your job is easy. If they think your job is easy, they're going to give it to an AI. And you have to really convince them that there's really a lot more to API design than just plugging in a prompt and getting an answer back out. Um, so I'm going to skip over this. So now you've got these generative AIs breathing down your neck. Um, to me, I think using a generative AI and these prompts is sort of like pushing a horse with a rope. You know, you know what you want it to do, but you just don't have the right tools. And trying to point the horse in the right direction with a piece of rope is really a very hard task to do. And I think right now, the state of the art is that's, that's really where we are. Is Prompt engineering may be the answer, but I think we've got a long way to go. And as Paul talked about, um, probably having AIs assist with prompt engineering is going to be something that, that can help. Um, and that human feedback loop is going to be the important part. And that's what Paul talked about as well, is us staying in the loop and orchestrating or guiding the process and adopting tools, et cetera, in, in a reasonable way. 
So I think good APIs to me are really kind of frustration-free packaging. And there's a lot of things here that you can read. I'm not going to go through them all. But I really do think that a good API can be a joy to work with. That's my ultimate goal. So I think a APIs can be beautiful and elegant and pragmatic at the same time. One thing I want to say is that an, AP an AI is really just a software artifact. I don't really want to say that an AI is good or bad. Just as a person who designs APIs is not good or bad. We can, we can judge the outcomes and say whether an API is good or bad. But let's not assume that the, the software itself is good or bad. Um, there's a few things here to, to mention. Um, using these tools is not really so different from consulting books um, or courses and workshops or tons of websites and YouTube videos and blogs, et cetera, or using colleagues. And that's really what our goal is going to be, is to work together and just adopt AI as a tool, but use it in a meaningful way. Um, I'm running out of time. I've got a couple, a little bit more material, but I'll share that with people if you want to offline. So thank you for your attention. Um, and I'll jump to the, the end here. Um, I did mention earlier, um, I've got a substack called API Design Matters. Feel free to, to subscribe. I talk about all kinds of things related to API design. And, and you can use those social media links that I mentioned earlier if you want to talk to me again. So thank you for your time and I appreciate it. And let's, let's continue the discussion throughout the rest of the conference. Thank you.